Before the children were born, they had done neither good nor evil, but that the purpose of God according to election might stand. The scripture saith, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Now what are you going to do with something? I, I talked with someone recently about that, and they said, well, I can't really say that I agree with that. I said, well, it's in the Word. Well, that's scary and that's frightening. Well, yeah, it kind of is. It puts the fear of God in your heart. I think some people, it puts a different type of fear in their heart than it does in our heart. It puts a fear in our heart because of this awesome God that we serve. It puts a fear in their heart because they have a very serious suspicion that they are a Jacob. I mean, that they're an Esau and not a Jacob. I know how people think, you see. You, you can read it on their face and... And I think that's why a lot of people want to reject the biblical view of the sovereignty of God in electing grace, in particular grace, because they're kind of afraid I might not be a Jacob, I might be an Esau. And they know enough about Calvinism, quote unquote, to know this, that if I'm an Esau, then there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> Ooh, that is a frightening call. But you see, the elect don't ever have thoughts like that. Well, if I'm an Esau, then that means because you really you've gone beyond sovereignty over into fatalism. The Bible says if you're thirsty. It doesn't say if you're one of the elect ones, find out first and then try to get saved. It says if you're thirsty, then come and drink of the water of life freely. Hallelujah. Puts all the burden on you. It doesn't say now, watch out what happen what's happening behind the eternal decree seen here. It says if you're thirsty, if you're not, that's too bad for you. If you're thirsty, well, what if I'm thirsty but I'm not one of the elect? There's no such thing. Amen. If you are thirsty, come to the water of life and drink freely. Amen. See, I know that's in the Bible. People get into fatalism. They try to caricature Calvinism as being Greek or Stoic or philosophical fatalism, and it's not. The two are not the same. The Bible has a real mysterious balance in between, and the elect are going to understand, and I guess it's kind of like the Bible says, and the rest are blinded. I know it said that for Israel, but I guess that's true for the whole world. The elect, the sheep, understand, and the rest are blinded. But the ones who are blinded love to have it so. They ha they haven't, they're, not doing, they're not trying to do anything other than what they want to do, and that is to persist and to persevere in their unbelief and in their rebellion and uh, rebellious hard heart against God. Well, back to what I was saying. What happens if, if you reject denominationalism in, in the wrong way? I hope you're following me here. I hope I'm not uh, just talking to empty air and you're not understanding what I'm saying. I hope our own church in history kind of serves as a, a source of interpretation or grid for what I'm saying right now. But if you reject it in the wrong way, what happens is, you, as I heard one charismatic minister, this was really interesting, I think I've told you this years ago, black Pentecostal minister, I think he's got 14,000 members in his church, Got the message under Kenneth Hagin's ministry, believes faith and prosperity, extreme views in that area. That's the old health and wealth, name it and claim it type movement that they're in. He said, I've got a whole library filled with hundreds of theological books and I've never picked up one since I got the Holy Ghost. Well, that'd be wonderful. I wouldn't even fault that as long as I can turn to your tapes and your books and your theology and it's all in line with the Word. Then I'd say, I guess you didn't have need of anything else then. Can't fault that. I'll never fault a brother if he said, I never read any book but the, but the Bible, as long as you end up with all the truth. I won't fault you. I'll be the last to fault you. I'd be a fool to fault you. But the problem is, I haven't found someone like that yet. I, I think the situation is, things are complex out there, and you have to do some bouncing off in your own mind with where other people are coming from. You don't just pick up the Bible and just understand everything all by yourself immediately. We have a whole history of doctrine and errors and heresies behind us and around us. And I'm afraid to say ahead of us as well. And the more you know about that, or I'm not going to say the more you know about that, I'm going to say if you know what you need to know about that, it helps you, it helps God. God uses that as a channel to bring the truth to you. God doesn't just unscrew your head or slice it open and pour all the Bible knowledge into it, does he? He works through your experiences and he works through your contacts. Some have not been very good, so you learn what not to believe. He works through all that. He has channels, you see. It's like election and grace. If God's elected you before the world began to be saved, you're going to be saved. There's no ifs, ands, buts, ors about that, right? But is it just going to happen? No circumstances. He's going to arrange things in such a way you're going to, 
get convicted. You're going to hear the gospel preached. You're going to feel sorry in your heart. You're going to end up with a bad home situation and cry out to God. You're going to be on your back in a hospital bed looking up to heaven. Something's going to happen that he's going to use as a channel to get that grace to you. He doesn't just, just say, well, all right, I'm just going to give you grace. Something happens. He uses a channel to get that to you. That's what he does with the truth as well. He uses channels out there and brings the truth to us. And if someone, someone would probably like to say, well, I'd rather have it another way, well, maybe we all would, but I haven't found that to be a case in any regard, not in anybody's life. Someone who said, I've never read any book but the Bible. When I check them out, I find they've got all types of problems in their life. Now, we could probably spend the rest of the night saying, well, I wonder why that is. Why can't you just read the Bible? Well, I don't really care to debate that or whatever, get into that. I'm just saying that's a fact of the matter, so we ought to deal with the facts the way that they are. It's been often said of Smith Wigglesworth that he boasted of the fact, and maybe he did it in sincerity, and so I don't fault this, but because he was not a very good reader or speaker, rather illiterate, then it was proclaimed by him and about him since his death that he never read any book but the Bible. Well, I guess that'd keep you out of a lot of error and deception. There's no question about that. Think if, they, if you never read any book but the Bible. There'd be a whole lot of things that you wouldn't believe that are wrong because you never heard of them. But I'm still wondering about your whole system of doctrine, your whole system of theology. I don't think it's going to be in line. I don't think it's going to be on par with the Word of God. This black brother that I'm speaking of here, speaking of here a moment ago, never read any of my books since I got the Holy Ghost. You know, Spirit of God, Spirit of Truth, He'll guide me into all truth. Now, how's He going to do that, though? He's going to use channels. You think He used Kenneth Hagin, why can't He use another one? Kenneth Hagin doesn't have all the truth, that's for sure. If you let God use that channel, who said He can't use some other channel? Maybe He can use Kenneth Hagin to teach you something about faith or the charismatic movement. Maybe you need to read Calvin and understand something about theology, though. It's funny how people, people really aren't consistent. They'll say, I don't, I don't believe anybody, I just believe whatever the Holy Spirit tells me. But they've got their own selection of who they listen to and who they follow, who they believe. So it's a relative matter that I don't, I, I, just, I just think that denominationalism is sin and that means all Pentecostal writers and their writings, all denominational writers and their writings are all wrong. They all have a spirit behind them. I don't want to pick up any of that. I don't want to read anything. Well, again, here's my statement about that. If that's what you want to do, fine, and I hope everything works out well for you, but I haven't found that to be the case yet. Now, if we just haven't found the, the uh, one person that's the exception, then maybe we're still looking for them. I haven't found that to be the case. If this brother wants to reject all of his books and all of his reading and say, since the Holy Ghost came, I don't need that, that would be fine if you're correct in every area of doctrine. But I know this man, and he's way off and more areas than Calvin was off in. You ought to try to use the good that somebody else has thought of before you rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, now that the wheel is here, why try to reinvent it? Why not go ahead and use that and try to build upon it? People are going about trying to reinvent the theological wheel, charismatics. And they think they've got better knowledge now. And charismatics almost with one voice reject the doctrine of God's sovereignty and election. In particular election, that is the election of individuals versus election of the nation of Israel. A lot of people will agree with that, but when you talk about individuals, oh no, they'll see all the verses in the Bible are just talking about uh, electing or election of nations. But what about Jacob and Esau? Those were individuals, the children, before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, so that Jacob's selection could not be attributed to any good works. And so and here's what's almost beyond our comprehension and too much for many people to receive. And so that Esau's condemnation is not due to his own works. Wow, before they had done anything good or bad, good or bad, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. The scripture said that the elder will serve the younger, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Somebody needed to stay in a theological system called Calvinism just long enough to get that truth and then throw out Calvin's teaching on communion and water, infant baptism, and all of that garbage that you'll find in the second book of Institutes. Well, let me read something from Warnock here. This is the very first page now of Warnock's Feast of Tabernacles, his The Classic Latter Rain Manifested Sons of God book, I guess I could say. When Jesus declared, notice how smooth and how 
almost agreeable the statement is that has just swept multitudes of Pentecostals along into the river with them. When Jesus declared so emphatically, I am the truth, he there and then completely demolished the idea that truth has anything in common with creeds and doctrines and theories about God and spiritual things. That sounds so pious there, that there's nothing in common between truth and, what do you say, creeds and doctrines and theories about God and spiritual things. But you see, if any of those creeds and doctrines and theories have any element of the truth, then there is a relationship between truth and those creeds and doctrines. They reject all creeds. And we don't, we don't worship creeds. We don't say that you've got to subscribe to Nicene or Athanasian or Apostles' Creed. But there's a whole lot of truth. More truth, and you know this from our teachings in theology, more truth in those little creeds than you'll find in you know, a whole book of Smith Wigglesworth or whatever. Smith Wigglesworth is good for whatever that wiggling person was good for, and Calvin was good for what he was good for. So that's a real smooth statement. It sounds so uh, acceptable to a lot of charismatics. You know, when you just get the baptism, there's just that, if you're, if you're listening to the Spirit at all, there's almost that immediate um, repulsion that you have toward man-made systems and doctrines and creeds because now you have a living uh, relationship with the living God. And now it's no longer creed. But you see, that's what's happened. Before, you know, they're just seeing the contrast in the before and after. That before... It was all in going to church and the Lutheran creed and the Presbyterian symbols and the Roman Catholic encyclicals. And now I have a living relationship with the living God through the Holy Spirit. That's wonderful. But there still may be a whole lot of truth that you don't just get by having a relationship with someone. We talked way back in the beginning, I remember, of systematic theology that a lot of people want to reduce Christianity to nothing more than a relationship. And the Bible says, no, no, no. Christianity is a relationship. If you don't have that, you don't, you're not a Christian. But it's built on sound doctrine, though. Titus, Paul there is always encouraging sound doctrine. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Why didn't Paul say, listen, you've got the ghost from above. He'll guide you into all truth. Forget about that doctrinal business. It's more, it divides people more than it unifies anyway. Doctrine is divisive. You know, that's a rallying cry today. Doctrine is divisive. Paul said, speak the things that become sound doctrine. And there was no more pneumatic, charismatic soul, as far as I'm concerned, ever than the Apostle Paul, who had visions and dreams and revelations and miracles and of every sort and variety. And yet Paul walked in the middle, you see, of that theological road. He had the balance there. He knew that you've got to be a Pentecostal, a charismatic, but you can't dare surrender doctrine. You surrender doctrine... And then you have a doctrine less Christianity? That's like Kierkegaard. That's like the romantic theology that came out of the end of the 18th century, that Christianity is an emotional, intuitional type experience that you have. It's not. It is a factual event and matter that happens in your life, and it's based on factual, recorded, objective, written, propositional truth called the Holy Scriptures, called the Word of God. And whenever you have things put together in such a way in a theology class, hey, this is just the way that it is. You take that with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're going to understand a lot more about God than you will otherwise. So I can't buy this statement by Warnock, but I know where he's coming from. And so his whole book here, you see, since, since you can't go by doctrine or by creed, then you can't discern his book. Because that means whatever anybody says is just okay. He'll pick up, Oh, you know, those two silver trumpets back in the book of Numbers and say, now the first trumpet, that means such and such. Well, says who says where? How do I know? I just, it's just your word. You tell me the first trumpet symbolizes this. I'm not aware of any passage in the Bible that would even give me an indication that the first trumpet spiritually symbolized this and the second trumpet, you know, those two silver trumpets that were made and the second trumpet for the New Testament church spiritually symbolizes this. Man, I've got to have something to go on. I don't have anything to go on, but what he says, he says, this is what I believe. Because the Spirit shows you, you see. That's like what we're into in our own movements right now. Isaiah 28, it's a strange thing, my strange act I will do. And as I keep telling you, that's a play, that's a pull for us to surrender our discernment. So I disagree that when Jesus said, John 14, 6, I'm the truth, that he there and then completely demolished the idea 
that truth has anything in common with creeds and doctrines and theories about God and spiritual things. Now, I know how someone might say, well, he's really not talking about true creeds or doctrines. He's talking about it from the man-made sense. But I know Warnock, and I know Britain. I know these people. I know where they're coming from. So I've got a little more to go on than just this one statement. I know what they're, where they're coming from, and they just believe in rejecting all that stuff. All that's just man-made systems. Calvinism, just a man-made system. Well, that's right. Calvinism is that. So you can't subscribe wholeheartedly to everything Calvin said. I suppose that's why, friends, in the past we have had to describe ourselves as Calvinistic in this regard, dispensational in this regard, Pentecostal in this regard, fundamentalist in this regard, and evangelical in this regard. Because none of them have all the truth. And yet God says, and I'm going to send you the spirit of truth, and whenever he comes, he will guide you into all of the truth. So you have to describe yourself as manifested sons in this regard, latter rain in this regard. We are latter rain in, the, in a certain regard, maybe not in their regard, but in a regard. Who else is really teaching Romans 8? I never read or heard anything about Romans 8 until I got with people who were influenced by people who were teaching Romans 8. The sons of God are going to be manifested to this groaning creation. That's what Paul said. I'm manifested sons. <laughs> but hold on now. There are, what, how many, five or six tapes before this and a whole lot after this stuff. I'm manifested sons. If that's what you mean by Romans 8. But I, I'm not somebody else's interpretation, though. I'm not when you change the prepositions and say that the uh, kingdom or the, that, the, um, that the creation is going to be delivered by that's not what Paul said. But he did say that the sons of God are going to be manifested too. You just changed the preposition there that it's going to be manifested to this groaning creation. Amen. That's going to be a real glorious event. Amen. We're going to be manifested as God's sons to the creation. That's what the manifested sons of God people taught. They just taught a few more things added along with that. So you know if a few years or some time back I had to give you a list that were Calvinistic in this regard and such and such in this regard and such and such in this regard because it, it, it shows what, it's, what, what that is saying is that these are the elements of truth of notable truth found in these certain systems of theology or these systems of doctrine here and it all has to go back and be judged by the word of God the word of God supports from Genesis to Revelation literally not well, those two books and nothing in between, or a couple of books between those two, from Genesis to Revelation, the doctrine of God's sovereignty and personal election. That it's an eternal decree. Ephesians 1, you are predestined before the world began to the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. Now, Jacob, is, Arminius didn't teach that, but John Calvin is, so we're Calvinists. But Calvin taught infant baptism, so we're Baptists. But Presbyterians taught that there were elders in the church than were Presbyterian. But the Episcopalians felt that there was an Episcopus, a bishop, over. So we're Episcopalians. They all have an element of truth. The problem is whenever you get in one of those systems, you become so cocooned in that system that the truth that they have, Jesus said the system makes you truth of none effect. Whenever you're on the outside now, you can go back to the Pharisees and say, yeah, I believe exactly what they believe about the bodily resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. I believe the same thing the Pharisees believe about that. I'm not going to become a Pharisee because we agree on that point of doctrine and that point of systematic theology. I'm going to stay outside of them. They were an unbelieving, doubting, adulterous, perverse generation, Jesus said. Perverse people, I'm not going to stay with them. Yeah. Well, let me read something else here. One sentence. I hope I've explained it well enough that I won't need to explain this one now. We care not for established creeds or doctrines, or theological disputes. See, I know, they don't just mean like we could say that and mean something right by it, that we don't care, we just believe the Bible. But yet we're involved in all types of studies around here. You have to know our background and then know their background, then you judge the statements on the basis of the whole flavor, their whole background. They said, we don't care about established creeds, doctrines, 
And you know, theological disputes. And I say to myself, yeah, that's right. And it, it's real evident in your writings that you don't care. You don't care because you don't care you don't know. Because you don't know God's people perish for lack of knowledge. It's real obvious to me as I read their writings, that's right. They do have some truths in this one area that we're talking about, that denominationalism is a sin. They do have some truths there. But when they say, I don't care about theology and doctrines and all that type of stuff, I say to myself, I can tell. It's real evident in your writings that you don't care because your writings manifest how, how uh, lacking in knowledge you really are. How can a person who's read Daniel or Romans or Ephesians or Genesis 50 or the book of Revelation... How could they have read those passages and say, oh, I think God just lets anybody who wants to come into the kingdom and uh, he doesn't really have any say so in it. He waits till they decide. If they decide it's okay, they want to come in, then he gives them grace to do it. Then you're saying the initiation to salvation is by a human being. And you, you fail to understand not only God's electing grace, you fail to understand the nature of the fall of Adam, the nature of man, the nature of sin. You are dead, not not sick, not even mortally ill, you are dead in trespasses and sins, Paul said. A dead man doesn't make a choice. God has to come down and rebirth him before he can even repent. A dead man, a dead horse can't repent. A dead man can't feel sorry for anything. Do you remember a few years back again, to show you what our theological studies will do for us, I gave you a, a little theo theology test. We talked about the order, the so-called the theologians call the order of salvation, where repentance fits in versus regeneration. We think, well, you've got to repent, and then you get saved. No, you get saved first, because you couldn't repent. God has to do a work in you, first of all, and make you regenerate before you can repent. And a lot of people say, wow, man, that's... then you're just saying, here's what I'm saying, that salvation from start to finish is a work of grace. Anything less than that is a delusion, is a denominational works religion type thing. And then people say, but you're telling me that I didn't have any say so in it. That's exactly what we're saying. And, th and that's what Paul said in Romans 9 and in Romans 11. Paul taught that over and over and over again there. Whenever he got to the end, he didn't know what to say about it except, oh, for the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. His ways are unsearchable. His judgments are past finding out. He gave us a fairly full theological exposition of that matter, but even the Apostle Paul, he's only a man, came to the end of his knowledge and said, who can find out the mind of God? Now, Paul wasn't bickering over the whole matter. He just knew he was one of the election. He was rejoicing over it. And he said, we're saved for God's glory. Amen. We're saved to be a people of glory because God wants to work something in us and get glory as a result of that. It puts man in his place as a worm, which is what he really is. Job, he puts no trust in his saints, 1515. Even the heavens are dirty, unclean in his sight. This is a God with whom we have to do. Your salvation was not initiated by you. It was initiated by God. And you don't, you'll never understand that. You never would have known that until you get into theology. Then you understand it. Because all we can think of is from our own perspective, we think, well, one day, you know, I wanted to go and, and turn my life over. That's right. But if you understood it theologically, then you find out that God was working in a mysterious way. It's like the wind that blows in the trees, you see. You don't know where it comes from or where it goes, but so is everyone born of the Spirit. That was God working that in you. You didn't have a, a thought that was independent of God. It was God working in you. And people don't even learn those truths until you get into theology and study them. So someone who tells me I care not for theological disputes, I say I can tell. It's real evident in your writings. Here's something else they say down at the bottom of the same page. There are so many who would insist on a literal and natural interpretation if and when a spiritual interpretation would conflict with their theological views. What I would like to do is turn the sentence around and say there are many who would insist on a spiritual interpretation when a literal one would conflict with their theological views. They'd like to tell us we don't have any theological views. We just go by what the Word says. But they're wrong. They have a theological view called post-tribulationism. And they, don't, they will not take the Bible literally. What it teaches about a pre-tribulational rapture, they cannot do that because to do that is to bring that teaching of Scripture into conflict with your theological system. 
And your theological system along the order of manifested sons of God is of such a nature that you're saying, well, what's the purpose of God manifesting us if it's not going to be during the tribulation so we can help all these poor people down here and see billions upon billions of souls saved? You've already got a theological system in your mind, and what you do is you try to find proof texts to support that. And any ones that you find that don't seem to support that, you spiritualize them. That's the name of the game. That's the way you play this manifested son's game. It's the way, by the way, that you play a whole lot of theological games. Any scriptures that don't fit in your system, then you say, like I was reading in, well, I'll tell you about that maybe next Sunday morning if I can in the... First Timothy 2, but I, something else I read this week from a Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith, quote-unquote, minister. One of his daughters, I think it is, writing the uh, article in the center of their little mail out. And it's this, it's this play, women in ministry. She's a minister, ordained minister, so obviously she's going to teach women can minister. But, but what she was teaching there was she had run across a brilliant, and this guy's a fool. Some of you have heard him speak right here in this state. He's a fool as far as I'm concerned. Anybody who denies the Bible is a fool. But she ran across this brilliant, charismatic theologian, quote-unquote. They only use that term if they think they can get you over on their side and support all their funny doctrines, you know. Then they'll say, he's a great theologian. And if they don't like you, they say, he's a theologian. We don't believe in people like that. And you know what he said about Paul's, as also saith the law, 1 Corinthians 14? That was the law of the rabbis, you see. And Paul never got free of all of his rabbinical superstitions and traditions and things. Well, my, my, my. Whenever you find a scripture that in its plain sense doesn't fit your system of women teachers, then you try to find some way to get around it. Spiritualize it, deny inspiration of scripture, ascribe it to Paul's weaknesses or his fallibility as a man or whatever. Well, anyway, uh, that's why I'm saying we have to describe ourselves in various theological ways in order to touch first, second, third, base, and home plate as well. You don't go all the way around, and you probably don't cover everything. Sin of denominationalism, that's right, it is a sin. And uh, people need to come out real strong against that. The manifested son's people are to be commended for this fact, but, of course, the sad irony of the situation is they ended up right back in their own denominationalism. Now it's called manifested sons-ism or latter rain movement-ism. Denomination is when you organize your new little group and order along some pattern other than what the New Testament teaches. And
I feel like I could prophesy this, but I think I'll just speak it to all of you here. I've really sensed in the last month a real different type of anointing whenever I minister and teach. An anointing, it seems like it's an end time thing to just continue to remind you and to encourage you that not everybody who professes this walk is going to make it at the end. Just to continue to encourage you, you've got to keep on. You've got to overcome in your life. There are so many people around that have looked so very genuine. But our Lord told us the truth a long time ago. I mean, even ministers here, he's the only one who can read the heart. We can read the external signs that we have, and that's generally all we have unless we've got something supernatural, and we go by that. And sometimes, of course, our judgment is wrong because we're judging the external signs wrong. Only God can read the heart. I don't think we know, friends, how many ministers, I'm even thinking of them too, how many ministers and other people, how many ministers there have been who have come out and preached the word and preached the word and preached the word because that was their thing to do, and, and the whole time or part of the time or the end of the time before they left the wall, they were entertaining things in their heart like, I don't know about this, or ah, this is hard, or I don't even know if I want to believe all these things. Yet they'd come on real strong, come on tape, and they'd preach this and preach that, and only God, you see, can read the heart. But the end is always the final proof, though. If you don't endure to the end, you don't make it then. Nobody who gives up makes it. Uh, the name of the game is you have to endure to the very end. And it seems like every one of the messages, somehow something, we work around to the fact you just got to encourage you, you just got to keep on going. Don't worry about what's going on around you. Don't worry about all the people falling around you. Amen. Just keep on keeping on in your own life. Right. Things are not as glorious and uh, with all the blooms and flowers as they were here a few years back where... It just seemed like this movement was growing and growing and growing. Now just the opposite has happened. We're on, a, we're on a downward swing. We had all of these numbers of people, and they began to get cut off. Media persecution, deaths of babies, deaths of other people, cut off, cut off, cut off, falling away from the faith, dying here, dying there, leaving it. God's just been trimming everything down. I mean, this is a tremendous thing that's happened. We shouldn't take this lightly. We're in some very, very difficult times now. I know of some of the persecution and just adverse circumstances that our little group has received and gone through even the last month, let's say. And that doesn't count all that the other true groups are going through and all that the other true ministers are going through. It's not just like a bed of roses for any of us in this walk. There are trials and there are temptations that we go through and that we have to overcome. But I just wanted to encourage you again tonight that it's very important. It's very serious what we're in. And I don't know. I guess this is the way it has to be. Maybe the Lord knows best that uh, the only way to expose how serious the walk is and all of the incredible shallowness that's been in this walk is just to let all these things happen. I know I never would have guessed it 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It just seemed like it was going to grow and grow until the sons of God got manifested and emptied all the hospitals. Now that's not happening. Now we're losing members by the droves now. Now pastors, some of them are out of work. That is, they've got to go to work part-time because they preach the word and lost so many members in their church. They're down to five families in the body. Well, we're in for some hard times. That's just the way that it has to be sometimes. So pray for the ministers that you know of. Pray for the true ministers. Hold them up before the Lord. Encourage them whenever you have the opportunity. Brother Hamilton a letter, give John a call, and encourage them, support them. Because people need support. The, the true people, the ministers as well as the people, need support in times like this. You don't even know what all the ministers go through. You just don't even have any idea what they go through to maintain the balance, let's say. Because you've really got to search and seek and think and pray diligently to find what the scriptural balance is in all of these areas and not be throwing, you know, too much out. You, you've really got to seek and strive to find that. Ministers have a particular difficulty they're always confronted with. And the people, of course, have their own difficulties. So as Paul said in Ephesians 6.18, that we ought to make intercession for all the saints at all times. We ought to make intercession for all of them. 
And as Paul said in 1st, 2nd Thessalonians 3, he said, pray for us. He's asking for the saints' prayer for himself. He said, pray for us that the word of God may have free course. Pray for us that it won't be hindered. Pray that the word of God may have free course. Praise the Lord. Remember these things, saints. It's very important. Don't go by the numbers. Don't look around you at the numbers. Only the truth and the Lord and with him on our side, only these things are important. Praise God.